Good morning, everyone. If you don't mind, we'd like to get started now. Thank you for coming today. We really appreciate it. Hope you've had a nice breakfast and coffee. My name is Shauna Sadler. I'm the director of the Digital Library and Innovation at Deakin University in Australia. I'm uh, formerly from University of Calgary and originally Canadian, so I don't have an accent yet. But maybe next year, if I present, I'll come with a few Aussie sayings. Uh, so I'm here today with my colleagues, Renee Riom from University of Calgary and Mike Nutt from North Carolina State University. So today we're going to be speaking to you about video walls in academic libraries. And yesterday, uh, UNC Chapel Hill and Georgia State presented on visualization walls. And we do want to reiterate that there is a difference between the two and we support uh, how they define visualization uh, walls. Um, we do find that video walls tend to be in public spaces, high traffic spaces, and that content is prepared ahead of time and scheduled versus visualization walls, which tend to be workspaces with real-time content. Okay, so I'm gonna to speak to you about what we have at Deakin University. Uh, so just quickly, Deakin has uh, four main campuses, each with its own unique library. Um, our video wall installation is at the Waterfront Campus, and uh, this is the view that we have from our library. I thought I'd show that off a little. The demographic that we serve at the Waterfront Library is mostly undergraduate students between the ages of 20 and 24 years old, and 60% female. Uh, there's a roughly even distribution across the disciplines of business and law, health, and the science, and sciences. So we do tailor our messages to this group and keeping in mind their information needs at specific points in the semester. So this is our video wall. It's five high resolution touch screens, uh, five point touch screens uh, with zoned overhead speakers. And we have named the wall The Verge because this wall, these screens are intended to be um, a window into our digital library. So here are programmatic objectives. First and foremost, this is a renovated library space. So with the renovation, uh, we installed this, this video wall. Uh, so we wanted it to be an impressive space. When people came into the library, that they had that wow factor. Uh, second is to have um, an opportunity to introduce people to our digital library, both our collections and services. And third, the intention was for the screens to act as individual workspaces for them. So you can see they're on pivots, and they're, they were intended to swivel 180. So we've been operating The Verge for about a year now, and I'm happy to report on some of the successes that we've had. So first, the students are reporting that they do like The Verge. Uh, it does set a positive and progressive tone to our library. Some of our initial observations, that students will walk by and they look at the screens for about two to 10 seconds. Uh, we recognize that this is passive engagement instead of the active engagement that we had designed the space for. Um, but we do find that they are having impact, which is positive. We are still um, practicing and trying out new ways of measuring that impact. Um, we're getting there. But we have observed that we do need to keep the message simple, that we do have to implement a dynamic element to the screens. Um, that way we can catch their eye as they're walking by. Um, and this is also a best practice in digital signage. So we find that the best practices of digital signage apply to our video wall installation. We have two graphic designers on staff, one of which is working at The Verge on any given time. Uh, we do create custom content for our screens because of the nature of the screens, uh, mainly because they are the five individual portrait mode, and there isn't much content that's originally designed for this type of display, so we do have to create it custom. Um, we use The Verge as one of the library's communication channels. That seems to be working well for us. The content is created as an exhibit and displayed uh, one exhibit per week. And we plan this content to meet the needs of the students at the time of semester. So here, uh, when students were preparing for essays, uh, we were displaying different types of digital collections that we had. So this is one that we have from Art Store. And what we've noticed as a best practice for displaying our digital collections is if we put them in context. So with this one, one of our graphic designers had just returned from Paris and she had visited many museums. And so she had put the images from Art Store in a frame and you can tell that there's a hardwood floor and a museum bench. There was it. You can see the bench in there. And that resonated with students more than just when we had put the images uh, just straight onto the screen. So that was a positive experience. Second is marketing our services. 
Here is Josephine, our architecture and built environment liaison librarian, um, and a collection of her recommendations and favorite books in the subject area. By the time we had put this exhibition up, we had been observing student behavior with the screens, and we observed that the three screens to the right were viewed most often by people passing by. So we considered these screens the most valuable real estate of The Verge, and we placed the key messages on these screens. So just a close-up of that content. So there's a picture of Josie, some of her recommendations, and her favorite books. One of the highest impact exhibitions that we've had has actually been from our special collections. Uh, Deacon hosted a children's literature conference, and so one of our graphic designers worked with the special collections librarian and found uh, these books from um, early Australian children's literature that focused on fairies. And so she digitized the images, with approval of course, and animated specific elements of the images, and we put them on the verge for the conference and for a week display. And they're just so charming, and even the undergraduates were, were interested in them, and now they're engaging, and they were asking about our special collections. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, so we're looking forward to having more undergraduates using our special collections. Actually, this graphic designer was also invited to speak at the South by Southwest conference for her work on this, so we're really quite proud of it. Deakin University Library is quite well known for the digital literacy initiatives, and so we have several animated videos, and we used uh, The Verge as a space to display these as well. And we also work with the campus marketing department overall, and so we, we are an active part of their communication strategies. So here's our display for orientation week. We applied the color palette and the style guide they had created. And here are some of the messages. So we created unique library messages for this event, but we, we were part of the holistic communications environment. I think it's fair to say Australians like their sport. And so, so in the library we display we, we, the uh, events live. And we do market it as saying, study without missing out on the action. And so here's a picture of when we uh, hosted the um, Aussie Rules football grand final, that's like the Super Bowl of Aussie Rules football, and it was Swans versus Hawks. Very controversial, very exciting. And we did quite a lot of marketing ahead of time to let students know that we'd be displaying, that we'd be showing the game. And we did have a lot of students studying at that time, and what was happening, they would check in with the screens to take a break, watch the game, check the scores, and it was fantastic. And, and they did let us know that they appreciated that we were there for them, that, that they could study and still be part of the game, so that way they they could speak to that, their friends about it. They weren't missing out. Uh, we've also shown the World Cup soccer, the Tour de France, and the one that surprised us is when we displayed the Melbourne Cup. I'm not sure if any of you know about this. It's a famous horse race in Australia. The entire country shuts down for a day. People are off work across the country so we can watch a horse race. So we showed it on the screens, and just for this five minute race, we probably had 50 to 80 faculty members, general staff and students stand shoulder to shoulder in front of the verge and watch the horse race together. And they all cheered for who they put their bets on. And it was wonderful. We didn't market it at all, but we had developed a reputation of showing events on in the campus. So, so that was a, a, nice, a nice turn of events. Uh, we've also started uh, providing gaming opportunities for the students on The Verge. So again, we're serving this demographic. They, this group of undergraduates, this age, they are involved in gaming. Gaming is part of their lifestyle. This is how they relax. So during exams, we want to provide them with an opportunity to, to take it down a notch, to be able to take that space, to game for a little while, relax, and then go back to their studying. And you can see this one gentleman decided to uh, celebrate his graduation day with a little Mario Kart. We also like to introduce our students to new kinds of content, not just what we have, but we, we have this piece that's an interactive art piece from the University of Calgary, and Renee will speak to that later. And the students got a real kick out of it. They, it certainly caught their eye. They walked by and there was a bull huffing and puffing at them. And it's hard to see here, but there's a Microsoft Connect that's a sensor base. So as you walk closer, the bull gets agitated. And when you stand on the last footprint, the bull charges you. And it's quite an experience. And, uh, and it was something new. So the, the students had never seen anything like that before. And they, they thought that was really interesting. And uh, we, we did have one faculty member say that he wanted to do an Australian version. So he could have a kangaroo charging you. So we would definitely host a kangaroo. So here's some quick lessons that we've learned in the year that we've been running The Verge. It's the touch feature. 
So on The Verge, the video wall itself, the students have not been touching the screen. So this image on the bottom, those are two actors that we paid to pose. That's what we wanted to happen. It's not what really happens. The students walk by, they do look, but they don't touch the screens. Now, I do want to quickly say that we do have individual touch screens uh, scattered through the library, and they are touch screens. Um, more for wayfinding and information, like shopping malls and airports, those have been successful. The students do rely on those, and we've been told very clearly not to take them down, not to change the content, because they rely on them for their academic experience. So that's positive. Um, we are going to try other modes to make The Verge interactive friendly. Um, you know, Joan Lippincott uh, speaks to creating spaces that are intuitive to students so they know how to behave in that space. And we've been trying different designs on the screens, but that hasn't worked. So we're going to try different types of furniture or maybe um, trying to divide the space a little bit. Um, we're going to try new things and hope it, hope it works. We've, we've had a bit of trouble with some of the vendors. We thought it would be easy f to market what we licensed from them, but it's turned out to be quite a challenge. They were not giving us permission to display their content on our screens. And so we've had to be, um, we, we've had to be creative with how we do it. So when we had created Josie's screens, we had to type the, the names of the titles. We couldn't uh, put a, a logo or an image display of them. And um, the best we could do for her favorite books was to take a picture of three quarters of the binding instead of the front cover, which is what we wanted to do. So if, if you're thinking about video walls, please keep this in mind that maybe the vendors are still getting their heads wrapped around this concept, um, but it's, it's been a challenge for us. We also think it's important for the students to have takeaways. And uh, we've been working with QR codes and bit.ly links, and those have had limited success, but we're, we're continuing to work on that. And some of our future plans is um, with the content creation, we're working with more open access objects and creating um, some different exhibits. And so here we did one for uh, exam study tips. And uh, so we are an open access library, so we thought it'd be best if we walk the talk. And so we are making our content available through our blog for other libraries to use. And I'm having a hard time getting the students to engage with them, with the screens, uh, intuitively, so I'm going to bribe them. So this is an exhibit we're calling more than just books. So if they can read that in this eye chart, they can also read on the bottom that they get a $5 gift voucher to the library cafe. We were joking. We're going to train them Pavlovian style. And then, um, inspired by our colleagues, we're going to start looking at the rest of Deakin for other sources of content. There's content being created at all sorts of places. How can we reuse that content in our space? And of course, our graphic designers will have to be involved because of the unique style of our screens, but we think it's important. I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Renee. Good morning. The public video display walls that I'll be speaking to within the uh, University of Calgary are within the Taylor Family Digital Library. And I'll again make some distinctions in terms of what we're speaking to here today. We have two public media walls, both on our first and second floor, but also too we have an array of Christie digital tiles that we use in various installations. And so we sort of have a spectrum of built-in interactive video displays as well as sort of pop-up interactive displays. So here's the first floor of the Taylor Family Digital Library, and you can see our media wall there, and then the one that we have on the second floor is a direct replica of that. To place this in context, um, at the height of term, we probably have about 10,000 people a day coming through this space. And on the first floor, there's doors on either end, so it's very much a, a thoroughfare. Um, so it's fantastic, it's busy, but just as Shauna spoke to, it's, it's a limited engagement that people have with these screens. And what we found in experience is we end up either having something that people sort of pass by, or we start to create little events around the screens. Um, and so then that creates some greater en engagement with them. So for our programmatic objectives, really the, the screens are intended to highlight, support um, events, exhibitions, creative endeavors of the University of Calgary and also uh, support creative collaborative endeavors, showcase libraries and cultural resources collections. Uh, again, we've, we have libraries, we have special collections, we have archives, we have museums. We've got a, a wealth of resources that 
that we can showcase. And also, too, is to, to maximize the, the use of the technology, including supportive research endeavors. And so that's where, too, a little bit later on, you'll see an example of how we use some of our Christie tiles to support research. Next, I'm just showing you some slides of things that we've had up on the media walls. And again, it's not to say that these are just the, the best works of art you've ever seen, but for us to, starting out on this, it was helpful for us just to even see what have people put up on their walls? What, what sort of things do they do? They do? Um, and again, for us to show that is to highlight collections, highlight features within the Taylor Family Digital Library, highlight the other libraries that we have, or just even events that are happening in around campus as well. And then two, again, a distinction that we've made here as well is that um, we also do have a visualization studio on our fourth floor. That's an entirely different, entirely different presentation, but also too is just to promote, promote other features of the building to, to people coming through. As we worked with the media walls more, again, we, we saw that we needed to create a little bit more dynamic with the wall. And so there are times where there, are, there is a display that's just sort of a, a static display or rotating display. But whenever possible, we try and create some sense of movement with what's happening up there. And so when we introduced 3D printing in our uh, third floor digital media commons at the start of term, we wanted to create some kind of action and dynamic around that. And also, too, just even with open access and open access week, uh, just to have something a little bit more dynamic, more movement to, to catch people as they come through. And then well, as well, um, this doesn't do it justice, but a, a, an exhibition that we had within our visualization studio, and, but to promote it again on that first and second floor when people come through. And I think as Sean has alluded to and what Michael speak to as well, it, it's difficult getting interesting content, content that you can use on these walls. And so part of what we've started to do is work with partners across campus to see what else is going on there, what else can we get from students to put up on the walls. And so a partnership that we started to form with the, with the uh, chemistry department, uh, they too had their own media walls that they had in a high traffic uh, area in between some science theaters. And so we started to work with them on content that we could share with each other. And so the graphics on this are, are a little cheesier, but it's a, it's a contest that they had for uh, chemistry week. And so students could go around, take pictures around campus of what could fit into the periodic table, or also too what we had up on the media wall was sort of guess this element. And you could look at different pictures and, and guess what element it might be. And again, these images will look very familiar to you. You just saw them a minute ago from Deacon. And so what we did is we adapted the, the images from the exam time tips and worked them into our media walls. And again, you can see just a fundamental difference of going from portrait to landscape was no easy feat. Uh, so basically, we took apart the images and rebuilt them from scratch. But we love the idea and the creativity. Um, and so too, when we first put these up on our wall and we were going through just to see how things looked, that golden lab was up there and students walked through and again they don't normally stop and look at the wall but this student these students came up they looked and they squealed when they saw that puppy and we've never had anyone squeal at our wall before so we were onto something there and again just highlighting uh, conferences that we host as well and so some of our successes uh, to highlight an event that we hosted for the centenary of W. Mitchell, who is an Alberta author whose papers we hold in our archives. Our outreach librarian worked with a local school, W. O. Mitchell School, and part of their language arts assignment was to look at how does technology affect the process of creativity and the process of writing. And so somehow we dug up a bunch of typewriters and brought them into our main floor, brought the students in and showed them what a typewriter was and had them sit down and work with it. And so just the process of writing using a typewriter. Um, and across the way you can see the media wall, and I'll get to that in a second. But so we had them work there and then also then worked with our special collections and hands-on work with W.O. Mitchell's materials. And and then into our third floor digital media commons using high-end PCs, Macs, audio, vid audio video editing suites. So again, just that whole process of, of how, how does technology impact creation? And then we were able to bring in our, our visualization coordinator and we did a timeline of W.O. Mitchell's life and events and there too you can see the students looking at the media wall and 
and checking that out. So it was, for us, it was a nice way to integrate that wall in with an outreach program, in with some direct learning within the TFDL. Some further collaboration with Hunt, and Mike will speak to this a little bit later too, is uh, we got some code from Hunt and adapted that to our own uh, sort of student engagement photo participation. Um, we called it LibSpot, so students could take pictures around any University of Calgary library, submit that through to us through Flickr, it would come up on our media wall. But also what we did then too is we set up some pop-up Christy tile installations and you saw from the pictures of the tailor, the beautiful large glass windows facing out. Um, this is in Calgary, and this, we had this in January, February. So mornings are dark, nights are dark, it's cold, and it's just that time in term. And so it was beautiful having those images of the students' work sort of radiating out into different areas across campus and sort of brightening things up at that time of year. And here's a picture of our winner, randomly drawn. And Shauna spoke to the bull. Uh, and we set up the bull initially within uh, on our second floor media wall where it's a little bit less traffic and people can kind of play around in there a little bit more. And so again, it's it just through a connect and as you get closer to the wall, the bull gets more and more agitated and then it charges at you. Uh, we put this up first during the Calgary Stampede. And so that's an event that happens every July. It's a big rodeo, big trade show, everything, sort of nonstop party for two weeks. And so for us, it was, it was fun to add sort of an artistic endeavor to, to enhance the, the Calgary Stampede. Another installation that we had within the Taylor, so now going from sort of fixed media wall displays, tying in connect, now just directly into a Christie tile installation, um, was something called the Act of Looking. And this came from a program that we have where we'll lend out some of our technology to, to faculty to use in their own, in their own labs or, or studios. And so some computer science students were um, creating sort of a pop-up gallery elsewhere on campus and they needed some access to some Christie tiles. So we loaned them out. And we said, you know, but we want you to come back and bring some of your work in here into the tailor. And so this is one work that a graduate student did. And he had stitched together pictures of um, abandoned buildings and Again, as you got closer and at a different angle with the connect, you could sort of enter into this portal and go through different areas of the building. And another area of general success, I think, for us with the media walls has been, I use media events, and I chose this picture, and I know it's the one time our media wall was black, that they took the picture with, with our mayor, Mayor Nenshi, and you may know he was declared the best mayor in the world, and so that's why we were happy that he was there in our library, and he's been in our library many times. Um, but also, too, just like in Shauna's library, we have host sporting events, other things like that, where students come in and engage with the walls. So again, some quick lessons learned. I think generally, um, as we've worked more and more with the walls, we've learned to appreciate to use the walls within the context. And so again, they're high traffic areas, um, and just knowing what you can do with them within a particular context. And so everyone works within their own context. Your library is located in a certain part within your campus or is on a particular campus. And so it's being mindful of that. Um, also, too, with us, um, when we first had the walls set up, uh, we didn't have a really good software solution for managing them. Um, and so we were really like the Wizard of Oz, behind the scenes unplugging things, and it was really difficult to be um, responsive, be agile. And our team is a pretty agile team, but you've got to give them the, the technology and the, the software to work with as well to, to be agile. Also, too, for lessons learned, um, it's fantastic and we love sharing resources with, with Hunt and Deacon, um, but it takes time to repurpose those. Um, so you need the, the time and the support from your administration to put in that time and the expertise to be able to do it effectively. Um, also, too, I'll show you a, a ugly picture of our back room, is that it takes time to stage these installations. Um, so again, you, you literally need the space to be able to set this up, and then the, the time for people to go through and test things so that it works behind the scenes before you put it out front and center. And the installation that we had for the art of the act of looking, um, Jerry, the computer science person, he was in our back room for probably two weeks getting that set up. So it was great when it was there, but it takes time. 
time, and you need to be able to expect that. Um, this setup that we've got back here is in preparation for something that we're trying to test for a more sort of semi-permanent installation of Christie tiles within the tailor. And I'll just show you this picture um, just to highlight that um, within sort of setting up these walls, it can be high risk. Again, I said for us sometimes it was, you know, <laughs> maybe the emperor has no clothes, I don't know, but um, sort of the, the Wizard of Oz and just having things up and working. And so when it doesn't work, it's not good. Um, and I, I'll talk a little bit more with our collective recommendations about what happened with chemistry. Um, but when it does work, it's fantastic. And this is a picture, again, of our mayor as well, our university president, the tailors who are donors to this library. And so when you can create a venue and a, a forum such as this to, to be this kind of um, support for your university and where, again, the tailors, they had such a positive experience and, and how we were stewards for them within this library that when they wanted to give more money to our university they wanted that event hosted within the TFTL again and so again for us it's such a great compliment and so then that's the that's the high reward in all of this thank you and I'll pass things on to Mike hi good morning Mike Nutt uh, as of about five or six days ago the uh, director of visualization services at NC State which is very exciting um, before that, I was serving in an informal role as the editor-in-chief of the video wall content program that I'll discuss today. So I'm talking specifically about our James B. Hunt Jr. Library, which opened in 2013 as our second main branch uh, on our Centennial campus adjacent to our College of Textiles and College of Engineering. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, um, we have a number of visualization spaces, some of which are much more like the ones that were discussed uh, yesterday, uh, visualization walls that are more geared towards uh, active research and collaboration. Um, the installations that I'm going to be discussing today, uh, four video walls that uh, I think of as digital architecture. So we have almost 800 square feet of pixel space that's literally uh, flush with the walls, integrated into our architecture. Um, the, and all of these uh, installations that you'll see are the technology behind them is uh, Christie Microtiles. Um, so the first wall that you see as you uh, enter the library area is our art wall. Uh, it's a 20 foot wide uh, wall above our central service point. Uh, next you see our iPearl Immersion Theater, which we kind of think of as our premier exhibit space. Uh, it's probably the most visible wall because it's at eye level. Uh, so you pretty much have to see it as you walk into the library. Uh, it has a curved screen to create an immersive effect. It has both fixed and flexible seating and um, uh, speakers in the ceiling for audio. And uh, finally, a uh, touch screen in the space to uh, select content from. Uh, the third installation is in uh, kind of the heart of the building in our uh, academic spaces uh, between our two learning commons. Uh, this is the commons wall. Um, it's across from a staircase that allows for uh, kind of impromptu seating uh, and discussion. And finally, the visualization wall on the fourth floor is our most unique shape. Uh, this non-contiguous uh, arrangement uh, kind of epitomizes the, the blend of digital and, and physical that, uh, that you see in Hunt. Um, you can design content for a single rectilinear canvas uh, for this wall, uh, and it automatically creates a kind of picket fence effect. Uh, so three programmatic objectives that i like to discuss. Um, we're really focused on engagement. So we think of the content on the walls not really as an end in itself, but, but hopefully the beginning of a uh, relationship uh, with our faculty and students. Um, and we kind of think of engagement both as uh, establishing relationships, reciprocal relationships, where we're both getting something out of the relationship, uh, and also engaging in the sense of uh, creating interactive content that's engaging. So we never thought that we would provide all the content for these walls, so we uh, also uh, have a strategy of crowdsourcing content from our academic community. Uh, so uh, we, we think of this as a new form of scholarly communication, and we try to open that up by uh, uh, doing partnerships with, with our campus. Um, so for instance, this is what you're seeing is um, an image from a calendar that a graduate student association had made that we repurposed for our commons wall. 
And finally, the walls serve uh, an aesthetic purpose. So the, the walls are kind of constantly changing and that affects the, the aesthetic of the environment. Uh, they provide a lot of wow factor for us. They signal to you when you walk into the library that you're in a different kind of library, uh, which is great. So quickly, a, a few successes. Um, so the, uh, the code base that Renee mentioned uh, was started as our project My Hunt Library, which is now uh, Lintel, an open source project that you can all download. Um, th this was uh, one of our kind of signature pieces of content that was there when we opened the library on day one, and it really hit a lot of targets for us, and that was one of the reasons why it was so successful. Uh, it was a way for students to engage with us so they can take pictures, tag them Hunt Library on Instagram, and very easily uh, create content for us by putting those images up on the wall. Um, it, it's always changing, so it's, it's dynamic because new pictures are, are still coming on, still coming on. Um, it's also, um, uh, we are ingesting these photos into our digital collections, so students are actually contributing to our, our permanent archival collections, and they've told us that they really value being a part of creating the story of NC State, our library, which was kind of unexpected. We didn't know how they would respond to that, uh, that aspect. Uh, and finally, it uh, allows people to interact with the walls with their own mobile devices, so with things that they'll, they'll have in their pockets, uh, which has been nice. A really successful piece of content is something called Listen to Wikipedia. So this is a visualization and a sonification of real-time edits that are happening to Wikipedia. Uh, so the circles change according to the size of the edits and they display the, the article there. This content already existed, so if you Google Listen to Wikipedia, you can find this. It's, it's beautiful, and you'll, you'll really enjoy it. Uh, what we did was contact the developers and add the interaction piece that you're seeing here. So by scanning a QR code, uh, you can get a menu on your mobile device that allows you to select which languages are displayed. Um, so that, this was a win in that it, again, features a way to interact using your mobile device. And also we saved a bunch of time on labor. We didn't have to create the whole thing. We just created a, a piece of it and added some value to something that already existed. We had a visiting scholar last summer from the University of San Francisco, uh, David Silver, who is the Associate Professor of get this right, media studies, environmental studies, and urban agriculture, which is probably the, the coolest appointment that I've ever heard of. Um, so David researches Black Mountain College uh, in Western North Carolina, which if you're not familiar with this uh, university, it's, it's worth your time to look it up. Uh, it was uh, probably one of the most experimental um, colleges in, in American history. Um, from the 30s through the 50s, it was an art college that uh, had faculty like uh, Joseph Alpers headed the uh, the painting program, Merce Cunningham, John Cage, uh, Buckminster Fuller. Um, and so what David did was construct a story of the, the work program, actually. There was a farm there, and the students worked on the farm. They actually built the barn there, uh, and told different parts of that story as he took a group of people through the building, using different visualization spaces to tell different parts of that story, uh, and kind of crafting the story to uh, be reinforced by the, the various uh, uh, screens. So we had uh, two happenings, we called them, and we uh, walked people through the building. And for, uh, for me, this was uh, kind of a proving point that, that Hunt Library is a storytelling building, which I think is a really unique aspect of, of the Hunt Library. So some lessons learned. Uh, always be lowering the, the barriers to entry for participation, especially if you're crowdsourcing your content from your academic community. Uh, so we're kind of relying on the idea from the tech world of uh, cookbooks. Um, so we're building recipes and templates that, that people can use. Uh, what you see here is the Photoshop template uh, that was actually used in the, the calendar uh, that I showed earlier. Um, so we have Photoshop templates for all the walls. Uh, but not all content is rendered content, that is not images or videos. Uh, so we also have um, HTML and CSS uh, code that you can download that, that gives you um, the, uh, a framework for working on the walls. Actually, a lot of the content that I'm showing are just large web pages, and I think that you'll find for these kinds of installations, web content gives you a lot of fl flexibility. So we're providing this code to make it easier for people to make web pages for the walls. Documentation. I'm not sure how many people in the room would own up to ever playing Dungeons and Dragons. Maybe you, maybe you kept your kids from playing Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so documentation obviously is important, but it's, it's not just important to uh, convey the technical specifications. Uh, the, the reason why I went with this kind of metaphor of using Dungeons and Dragons to create like a player's guide, like how do you use these walls, uh, was because I wanted to add more context to the, the technical specifications. So 
Uh, the art wall is better at abstract art. It's high in the air, so you don't want to put a lot of text there. Uh, the immersion theater has sound, so it's really good for music and voiceovers. Um, that kind of information is, is critical uh, internally and externally. So this started as a guide that we used internally, and that's why I could get goofy with it and uh, use dragons. Uh, I de-dragonified the uh, document, and it's now a document that I hand out to external parties when I'm meeting with them to, to create content uh, for the walls. Massively responsive design, so I mentioned that, that web content is important. So with Lintel and the My Hunt Library project, what we did was design a backend that could uh, drive both mobile display and large-scale video display. So you're probably familiar with the idea of uh, responsive design in the sense that um, uh, you want your content to, to look good both on mobile devices and computer screens. We took that a step further so that it looks good all the way from a mobile device to a massive uh, video wall, so saving yourself some development time there. New metrics, uh, so we've done a couple user studies at this point, and I think what you'll find with these kinds of installations is that traditional metrics like uh, dwell time and uh, information retention are, are not gonna give you the kind of return on investment that, that you really want. So uh, I'm a big proponent of an idea that Joan Lippincott has discussed before. Um, the idea of the, the library is a third place. It's not your home place, it's not your workplace, it's a community center. And conversations are a part of that, that, that community building. So when I think about our content, I think how many conversations is this piece of content going to generate? We want to have conversations with College of Design students about how they can apply what they're learning to these large canvases. Uh, we want to have uh, conversations with patrons who tell us about cool data visualizations they want to see. We want to have conversations with faculty members about how they can change their approach to scholarly communication. Uh, so th these pieces of content generate lots of conversations, not as much dwell time. Uh, so just a couple quick future plans. Uh, we're actually wrapping up a student visualization contest, a code art student visualization contest uh, that was designed to engage students in creating uh, generative art, so art that, that is animated and constantly kind of recreates itself um, so that, uh, so that well, one, we can fill up lots of screen time <laughs> by showing the, the pieces of art that they create over long periods of time. Uh, and two, um, th this is a, a skill that is, is really marketable for students. So uh, we're kind of thinking of these walls as a way to provide a competitive advantage for their students. Uh, designing this kind of content is, is lucrative. In the commercial world, you uh, can get paid lots of money to design gener generative art for these kinds of screens, and we're giving them real life experience that they can put on their resumes and help them get jobs. Uh, and uh, lastly, in terms of um, what's next, I, I think we really need to start wrapping our heads around how these video walls uh, can be integrated into the research life cycle. Uh, so thinking about things like, uh, can we market these walls as an avenue for uh, broader impacts and the NSF grants that some of our researchers may be uh, applying to, uh, and really understanding the, the needs of faculty in the, the research process. Um, so next we're going to move to a stage where we discuss some uh, collective recommendations that we've all uh, kind of talked about and are on the same page of, and uh, Sean is going to start us off. So I think what we've all, all three of us have experienced is um, the need to design the experience that you want your demographic to have in your space before you select your hardware. Especially when you're working with facilities and central IT, it's really easy for them to say, oh, there's this hot new product, you'll got to use it, it'll be great. You need to pause and think about how it will create an experience for your people and if that's what you want um, and sometimes the cheaper technology is better and so it is important to take that moment so specialized screens uh, provide unique user experiences that is screens that are not just your standard 16 by 9 uh, aspect ratio uh, that, that comes with the cost of kind of limiting the the flexibility of the the content that you make for that space both in the sense that uh, if you have uh, specialized screens that require unique uh, design experience, that limits the number of people that can create content for it. And also limits it in the sense that once you design content for that space, uh, it limits the, the number of ways that you can repurpose that content. You're going to want to be putting uh, stuff that you make for the walls on YouTube or on websites, uh, so you have to consider that uh, as, a, as a potential limitation.
All right, and also these kind of specialized um, installations require specialized expertise and support. Um, so you need dedicated staff to support these screens. Um, quickly, I alluded to what happened with chemistry. Um, the faculty member who was very keen and engaged on their digital walls, he got busy doing other stuff, handed it off to a support person, and those walls went black for a while. Um, so you need, you need somebody assigned to it. Um, you need the agile staff, the agile technology, and also you need to be able to hire the, the skills to support this kind of um, installation. So graphic design skills, digital design skills, you need that within this kind of space. I think in, in closing too, what we collectively had talked about last night and what we wanted to sort of put out to everyone for further discussion is that we can see even in our own conversations with each other and what we're seeing here is that there's a need to establish some sort of com community of practice and a place to either share resources, um, share ideas, um, alluding back to what Shauna talked about in terms of advocacy with working with vendors on being able to have this content publicly accessible. Um, we wanted to put that out there to people to see if there's if there's interest or some kind of place or means to to create this kind of community as well. Thank you.